Good? Cool. Um, so today, uh, today's talk is called Inside Onyx, and so we're going to go uh, and take a look at the design and how all of this works. Um, this talk is going to be based on uh, version 0.9.4 of Onyx, and I point that out because we're going to change some things in 1.0, but everything I'm talking about today should remain stable, but it's good just as a reference point in case you look at this later and want to know. Uh, my name is Mike Dragalis, and I'm the person who created Onyx. Uh, this project is about two and a half years old. I'm also the co-founder of Distributed Masonry, a company that officially backs and supports uh, the Onyx platform and does distributed systems consulting. Uh, before I, I really get going, um, who here has heard of Onyx before this talk? Wow. Uh, is anyone running it in production here? We're going to get there. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. So I, I, most of you know what it is, but if, if you want the really quick uh, summary before we get moving, uh, Onyx is a scalable, distributed, uh, fault-tolerant, high-performance data processing platform written purely in Clojure, uh, primarily intended to be used from Clojure. Uh, it has a batch and streaming hybrid model, so it's able to handle both of these workloads um, relatively transparent, transparently. Um, and, and the primary uh, objective for developing Onyx was to, to produce a uh, data processing platform whose API was its information model. Uh, we wanted to get as close to data structures as we could in, in terms of communicating what your computation is. Uh, so this talk is going to go pretty far in depth on the distributed systems aspect and how it all works, but just to make sure we're on the same page before I get rolling, uh, when I say that it handles batch uh, and streaming workloads, what I'm talking about with a batch workload is that we take uh, a set of static, uh, bounded, finite data we apply a set of pure transformations by using presumably multiple machines, which we call a cluster, and we produce immutable uh, output data sets based on that original corpus. This is an immutable uh, transformation to more immutable data. Um, so you'd probably do this for uh, aggregation or indexing or something like that. It's kind of offline computation. Uh, but the other thing that Onyx is really good at is, is streaming workloads, which is when your data incrementally shows up a little bit at a time. Uh, you ingest it one piece. It, it may never all come. It might be mobile data. Uh, so you're dealing with data of like an infinite length. Uh, and this is a harder problem because you're going to have multiple machines still, uh, but you're only going to be seeing incremental pieces of your data. So you're sort of reduced back to using mutable state by necessity because the problem is more about uh, accretion of data over time. So this, this is a harder problem, but this is uh, something that we try to do really well on. So Onyx is, is for batch and streaming workloads, and this is kind of what I'm talking about when I say that these are the problems that we solve. Uh, the payoff that Onyx brings is that it uniquely decomposes the different computational aspects into a set of data structures that declaratively describe the work to be performed. Because to be clear, building a distributed system is a really expensive activity for a company in terms of its development and its, its maintenance. Uh, but I know the one thing that you absolutely cannot afford to do is to be confused about what your cluster is doing uh, and executing at runtime. And that's why Onyx is the desirable thing. And since most of you in this room know what it is already, and we may have seen the conch talk about what the API provides and uh, why I think it's generally a good thing, um, I, I want to talk about how it actually works. Um, so I'm going to leave a lot of time at the end, maybe like 10 minutes for questions uh, to, to, to talk about... Uh, basically what's going on, because the design is quite unique, um, so I, I presume there may be some misunderstandings here and there, so we're going to try to like, clear it up as much as we can. Uh, so when we talk about the design of these distributed data processing platforms, uh, in my mind there's two really big pieces. You have a messaging component and you have a coordination component. Uh, messaging is all about the high performance, fault tolerant routing of data through your cluster. This is the thing that's taking the data from S3, it's, it's moving it through your cluster, and then it's putting it onto like a Kafka topic. Um, that stuff is really all about messaging, and that's not what I'm going to be talking about today, um, pr primarily because this is the thing that's going to change quite heavily uh, in Onyx 1.0. But probably more than that is because that the research in this area is moving incredibly fast. Um, just quickly to talk about what's coming, we're moving to a streaming engine uh, called Asynchronous Barrier Snapshotting, which is the new algorithm that came out of uh, Flink in the paper that they produced. Um, so if you keep up with that, that's where we're going. So just wanted to be transparent about what's happening there. Um, co oh, sorry. Uh, coordination, on the other hand, is about who is doing what in terms of the nodes in your computation and what's happening in your cluster. And this is what we're going to talk about today, because this is where things got really unique uh, in Onyx. Uh, so coordination, what is it? Who, what's going on around here? Who's doing what? Uh, what's supposed to be happening? Um, what do we mean when we say coordination? We're talking about 
who is in the cluster, who's working on what, did, did anything fail? Uh, are there new entities that are coming on and offline? And is there a change in load? These are the primary things that I think about when we're designing a coordination-based system to, uh, to ingest large amounts of data. And you can take these somewhat casual statements and then map them onto more uh, serious don't pieces in, in the domain of distributed computing. So you know, who is in the cluster would correspond to you know, the topic of uh, state snapshotting. Uh, who is working on what is really a bin packing problem. Uh, failure detection is its own well-studied topic in distributed systems. Uh, distributed re-entrant algorithms are, are quite difficult, and then you have things like elastic scaling. So you can go and you can find all the papers on these things. Um, and, and these are the things that make up coordination, and it, it's been a tough problem to tackle. Here's why. Um, most architectures for these kinds of platforms follow roughly the same design when it comes to coordination, and I, I would call this sort of a design a uh, you know, master workers architecture or like a leader followers architecture. Uh, and the idea is that the master is the brain. It controls absolutely everything. And the workers are just the raw muscle. They're processing your data. They're fairly dumb. They're just being told what to do, and they'll carry out your computation. And this is the way it's been for decades, quite a while. Um, there are a lot of pros to this architecture. Uh, the, the main one being that you've concentrated all of the coordination logic on a single machine, and so you get a more predictable performance profile on the worker machines. And that's really good if you don't have a whole lot of cores on your workers, because they can't afford to be doing things uh, that aren't related to the, to the task at hand. But there are plenty of cons to this architecture, too. Uh, you can have excessive stress and overwhelm the master if your nodes are doing too much and your, your, your master needs to be coordinating too many things at once. You effectively end up with a singleton in your design and it's managing global mutable state which is basically um, you know, the, the value that represents the cluster in terms of what the, the master is seeing. Um, the master node in these architectures progressively take on more responsibility and they sort of devolve into a dumping ground for other one-off jobs. You see this happen in so many different systems. If you have this little extra thing that needs to be done that's, done that's not related to the work at hand, uh, they end up going on the master node and things sort of degrade from there. But I think worst of all, uh, if they're not designed properly, it can become a single point of failure if, you know, even if it wasn't even designed to be highly available in the first place. So it's tricky operationally. You need to worry about an extra uh, program. Um, so while the messaging world is moving really, really fast, the world around coordination is like stagnant. Nothing interesting is happening. And in fact, Mesos was built on the idea that if you built a distributed system, it was going to look like this and it would overtake the responsibility of the master. So that's really cool. I think, I think that's a really good idea. But I wanted to explore what else could be going on here. I was, Onyx wasn't really popular when I started tinkering around with this sort of design, and we started out like this, but I wanted to move towards something with a different set of trade-offs, uh, and just to, just to see what, what could happen. Um, could, we, could we get new, new properties if we, we tried something else? And, and so what we ended up with is what I like to call the cluster as a value. Uh, Onyx is now a, a masterless system, and everything is oriented around the idea of an immutable uh, append-only log with a well-defined set of transition semantics. I want to be clear uh, about what exactly it does look like. Onyx's design is composed of peers, which are the equivalent of workers, and Zookeeper. That is it. Unless you start bringing on this, the, stateful, um, the stateful mechanisms to record durable state over time and get you know, exactly one semantics, this is what you're going to have to deploy. Um, so there's no master in Onyx. That being said, there is, there is a master in clustered Zookeeper. So that's the point that I want to... Um, make note of because it's a little nuanced. Um, so it's not fair to say that Onyx is completely peer-to-peer, -peer, but Onyx itself doesn't have a centralized coordinator, even if Zookeeper does. So just, just to hammer home that point. Okay, so we started off like this. This is what Onyx looked like as of version 0.4. And in 0.5, we, we did the following. Uh, basically, we took out the coordinator. We said, we don't, we don't want that anymore. I want to try something with, with no centralized coordinating entity. And when you move towards uh, a peer-to-peer-ish design, the canonical way to do that is to represent your topology uh, as a ring. Uh, and the reason for that will become apparent. And before I keep going, uh, something you might not have known is that before I did Onyx, my background was in um, 
kind of like database research. I was, was really interested in what was going on there. And so the design you're going to see is quite similar to a CP database, actually. So kind of keep that in mind. There's, there's a parallel that's going on here. Uh, anyways, to switch back to what we were talking about, right, we got rid of uh, the centralized entity. We don't have a centralized master anymore. We have a ring. And so the emphasis now isn't on uh, centralized storage where peers go to information for every time or where they uh, are, you know, being in the act of consensus with some other entity. Instead, we're going we're gonna to replace that with this notion of a replica, um, which is really meant to be the brain. And in fact, we give every peer its own brain. Uh, and this is the same brain that you know, roughly used to be in the coordinator. And the replica is going to consist of some information of what's going on in your cluster. Specifically, it's going to be the structural information that we discussed before. Things like who's in your cluster, what are the other peers, where do I find them, who's working on what. Um, of note, messages, your user-defined data, things that are like in S3 or Kafka, never touch the replica. I don't want anyone to get confused about that because this design would look horrible if that's what happened. This is strictly about coordination and which, uh, you know, the properties of your cluster runtime. Your messages never touch anything that I'm about to talk about. Using the replica, peers can open up direct lines of communication to one another. There's no centralized broker. They can just immediately look inside their own data structure, open up a connection channel, and start uh, byte shoveling as fast as they can. So we're going to reframe, this, reframe the discussion instead of a master directly commanding workers. Uh, I want to conceptualize cluster activity as a series of things that happen in a linear append-only log, such that every worker, every peer is going to see every event in the same order. And in fact, this is atomic broadcast, which is a fundamental topic in distributed systems, um, but by the act of every process seeing every event in the exact same order. So what happens is that when a peer or another process wants to enact change on the cluster, it creates a little message called a log entry, and it will append it to the end of the log. This log is sitting in the zookeeper. The log entry is then asynchronously replicated to the other peers in the cluster who are going to process the message and store it in their replica. We'll talk in a minute about what that means, but it's going to take the message and then stick it in its little local brain. Um, so we're making a trade-off here, right? There's no centralized coordinator enacting change. Peers are independently proposing changes to the end of this log, and then other peers are finding out about it as they asynchronously, rel asynchronously replicate. So there's less coordination than there was before because we've, we've basically turned this into a reactive architecture at the cost of using more CPU, CPU usage, whereas before you'd have a coordinator seeing every change and then you know, enacting and, and dishing out commands to all of its workers now every machine in your cluster is seeing every change. So there's obviously more CPU power being, being used. This sounds not good, but the critical insight is that the number of coordination-related events that happen in your cluster is generally pretty small. For, for small-ish and medium-sized clusters that operate on streaming workloads, I'd say we see like a few hundred to a, a few thousand messages, which is like Nothing. We don't, we don't need Kafka for a log here. We don't need anything high performance. In fact, we just use Zookeeper and uh, sequential Z nodes to represent this log. That's far and away enough. Um, so in effect, what you get is a durable change log of all events that have happened in your cluster. I don't know of any other platform that does this, and it opens up a set of very interesting features. And so you can actually subscribe to this change log through the API. And if your connection breaks while you're subscribing to the log, you can go back in time and look at changes that you lost and keep going forward, which is really nice because you can build things like automatically scaling up and down based on a uh, sort of reactive approach. If, if you see your cluster is being too busy, you can send warnings through PagerDuty just by building on top of, uh, on top of the changelog API. So this is quite unique and, and really nice. So let's talk about that log. It was a little vague. Peers are going to read from the log and they're going to apply entries to its replica as it moves forward. And this log, by nature of it being in Zookeeper, as a set of uh, sequential Z nodes, is going to be uh, monotonically increasingly ordered, starting at zero, um, so that all peers will know which log entry exactly they read by nature of its identifier. So these entries are going to be 
closure maps that represent functions and arguments to be applied to its local replica. The replica is just the data structure that sits inside the peer with well-defined transition semantics, and those semantics are defined by the functions inside the replica. We're gonna look at the keyword in the FN and resolve it to an actual function inside of Onyx and use that to update the replica. These functions are pure, deterministic, and idempotent. That is the critical thing you have to get right because the underlying property is that if any peer reads up to the nth entry, all peers who have read up to the nth entry will have the exact same value. That's how you get that similar, the, the exact same coordination mechanism and you'll reliably know that all peers are on the same page with what's going on because they're reading the same values, uh, getting the same replica at the same log, en log entry. Um, does that make sense? Are there any questions so far? Because this is like the really important part. I'm sorry, a little bit louder? Oh, so how do you know you're reading the same entries at the same time, in the same order? So Zookeeper's uh, sequential Z nodes will tag uh, every node that you append. It's like a little file system, like one, two, three, four, five. And then you can get a watch on the directory in Zookeeper and be notified every time there's a change. And what's happening is that the peer is keeping a pointer into the log. And every time it's a, there's a change, it's going to go back and say, I read the fifth entry. Now I must be expecting the sixth. So you know that every entry is going to get uh, the next identifier. Is there a potential conflict? In, in well, sure. The underlying data that uh, these functions are, are acting on. Oh, so you're talking about, it, like, does this lead, lead into CRDT land? Uh, yes. OK, so yeah, there's, there's no conflicts because they're only ever reading forward in the same manner, and you know that they're just going to apply a function to a map which returns a new map, so you're never going to have a case where two peers are going to conflict in terms of their operational updates, so you always get the same value as you move across. Uh, if you connect fresh to it, yeah. do you have to replay everything from the beginning if you're mm. a brand new node connecting to the... I will get to that. I'm going to keep going, so okay. cool. Good question. Uh, I'm just illustrating here that you were going to go ahead and point to every entry and just keep reading left to right uh, as fast as we can go. And again, the, the replica is just a data structure that has structural information like which peers are in the cluster, what jobs are active, and things like that. Um, okay, so we asked a bunch of questions. I think you guys understand the notion of a replica, but I'll just blow through these slides quite quickly. Replica is a data structure that's sort of like a, a journal or a trace of the real world. Things happen in the real world. Databases crash, networks partition, but we do know what things we did to the real world. Like we opened a socket, we opened a communication channel, and I can record those kinds of things in the replica and have a rough estimation about what's going on out there, and that's essentially the, the purpose of the replica. Uh, I like to think of this as a vector of maps in closure, and you can kind of visualize yourself going from one to the next and applying these functions if you resolve them to actual closure functions and then apply their arguments. Um, so the log is built around three, three primitives uh, that are going to transition your replica from one state to the next. The first one is apply log entry, which takes a replica, applies the function, returns the new replica, and advances it forward. Um, so if we only had that, nothing would ever happen because these functions are pure and deterministic. The critical thing that you need is a function to fire side effects based on the delta between an old replica and a new replica. And the other thing that's needed is that peers have their own identifier so they can identify themselves in the diff and see if they're related to any side effects that should take place. So in fire side effects, you're essentially taking, taking the diff, seeing if this involves me, and if it does, I'm gonna, apply, I'm gonna fire the side effects. And so that's how you don't get conflicting, uh, uh, conflicting operations. And finally, you can, you can have reactions based on seeing an entry. If it's applicable to you, you think you should do something else, you can have a reaction and append more entries onto the tail of the log. Uh, this is just a simple example of an implementation for turning on back pressure internally. Um, we, we extend the multi-method, and it's, it's quite simple. We have the entry as the first argument with its, with its args. Since we already know it's, it's the back pressure um, function, we, we only destructure the arguments. And then we take a replica. Um, and basically, we look in the replica and we see is this peer active? Is it doing anything? And, and if so, we, we flip on a switch in the replica that says, yep, back pressure's on for this person. Uh, we know that they're not going to be producing any more messages. And otherwise, we just return the replica. So this is pure, deterministic, idempotent, has all those properties that we needed before. 
And it's, it's a cyclic algorithm. It just keeps going iteratively. We take an old replica and a log entry. We feed it into the apply log entry to produce a new replica. And then we take the old and the new, fire it into fire, feed it into fire side effects, and then things actually do begin happening. And then we just recurse and keep going. And this is just the, the infinite iterative nature of a log-based design. What's really awesome about this is that debugging is fantastic because we can take a pointer to a production cluster if we know there's a problem, point it at a specific log entry and then move forwards and backwards and watch our, our replica grow and shrink and then detect where there's a problem and then rewind and then patch the code and then replay and make sure that we fix the bug. It's really cool to the point that we actually built some tooling around this. Uh, we have like a, a replica console viewer. Um, you can basically connect to Zookeeper and use the arrow keys to, to move across like your, your log over time and see what's going on. So you, you, know, you can see the log entry, which one it is. So this one is accept join cluster with these params. You can get a, a diff of what happened in the replica for easy examination. And then you get the actual replica itself at the bottom. So we use this for production diagnosis all the time. Uh, I would recommend if you're building a system similar to this, build this early. We, we waited like two years to build it. And oh my gosh, it's amazing. So I just want to stress the point that peers, when they're reading this log, are never blocking each other. They start at the beginning and they have independent pointers into the log. And this is why coordination isn't crippled. No one's blocking. Everyone's always trying to make progress moving left to right over time. They have their own independent replicas. And if they're all pointing to entry three, they're all going to have the same value as of entry three, no matter which point in time they actually get to entry three. OK? So uh, this assumes an infinite address space. And, and as this person asked, uh, what happens when, it, when a peer is going to come online later? It didn't, didn't catch the start of the log. So this is the topic of really more overlapping into garbage collection. Um, so I think, I think the answer will be apparent to your question after I'm done, but I'll just try to explain it first and we'll see, because this is mainly targeted at GC. So when you want to have a GC, uh, you invoke a uh, an API function because this is user driven. You don't usually need to do a GC. Most clusters we're seeing is like once a week. It's not, it's not particularly often. But basically what's happening is that there's an origin address that is constant and fixed and it's going to point to the head of the log. And so when a peer comes online, it goes to the origin and then it bounces to the first, to the first node. Uh, so when you do a GC, it's going to look for the origin and then it's going to set a marker to the last entry that it can find. So this is the new start. So that's marked and that's recorded. And then what the GC process is going to do is it's going to pretend to be an actual peer, which is basically what the, the log subscriber is going to do. And it's going to read every entry and build up its own replica. It will take that replica and store it in the origin address. So that way when a new peer comes online, it could just take the whole replica, pull it down, start reading from the beginning again. It will then instruct the origin to atomically point to the new start. And at this point, you can safely just go ahead and delete every entry before that. Now, if you had a reader behind you, it's going to throw an error, which we've, we've tested and we've made sure that it will actually just hard crash and then go to the new head. So if you GC, your peers might go offline if they're like latently reading behind. But in general, it's, it's not real really a problem. They'll just hiccup for a second and then bounce back. So. One of the problems with not having a centralized coordinator is it does the very important task of detecting failures. And without that, your system isn't fault tolerant, and that's a problem. So I'm going to describe uh, failure detection and adding in new machines at runtime next. And these were, I, I think these were two of the hardest things to do, because if we couldn't get these right, there was really no point in even doing it. As I said before, we have a ring-based architecture. And the idea is that every peer is responsible for the peer to its right or conceptually left. I like to picture it this way. Um, and so suppose we lose a machine. It just gets booted and it's gone. Um, what's hap what happens now is that the peer to its left notices that it's gone. It's using Zookeeper's uh, heartbeats and watches to detect failure. And it's going to look in its replica. It's going to say, oh, that peer's crashed. Um, I wonder which peer it was watching. Right? Who is on its right? And it, it will broadcast a message to the log notifying everyone that that peer is dead. And it's going to establish a watch on that peer. So it just tightened the ring atomically. Because so, it could just look in its replica and know which way it was because it has structural information. 
So you, one of the problems here is that you can lose uh, a contiguous set of the, of the ring all at once simultaneously before any of the recovery could have happened. And the algorithm, interestingly enough, remains the same. The only thing you need to do is to be able to report failures as you tighten the ring. So if you go, the, the peer in the upper left tries to recover to the, the second peer to its right, it's going to find that it's gone. So it just needs to continually broadcast messages that this peer's dead, this peer's dead, this peer's dead, and eventually it can close over. Um, there are special cases for when you have one peer or you have concurrently joining peers where things need to abort and back off and try again, but this is uh, essentially uh, a safe process that, that we've just been tested and I'm happy to say that it's working. <laughs> this, this is a tougher one. Yes? So you could theoretically have two circles of peers. You only have one circle. If, oh, you, if you get into a situation where there's about to be like a, a, a ring split, uh, one of the peers is going to back off and abort. Yeah, so we always want exactly one ring. If we ever violate this, this is really bad. Hopefully we don't. Um, can you repeat that? Sorry. So the, the peer on the bottom right here, if the, if the one that is watching is actually online, but for some reason it's misbehaving, yeah. uh, it could report that that peer is offline and type in the first one, right? And if it continues to misbehave and report that the next one is not online and type in the first one again. I think if, if we had a bug of that nature, that could definitely happen. Uh, I I think the reason we haven't seen that is because of the way that Zookeeper heartbeats work, where if it was not able for both of those to communicate, the original one was just going to drop offline and the one to its left was going to kill it. Right, exactly. But that's an interesting question. So that's how we handle failures. Uh, adding a new peer is the more difficult one to do safely, I should say. So if we have a new peer that wants to join the cluster, you need to do a three-phase process atomically to make sure it's going to work if you don't know who's in the cluster ahead of time. So the first thing the new peer is going to do is it's going to sign online and as it knows where Zookeeper is, it's going to broadcast out a message uh, we call the prepare phase, say message number 42. And because of the fact that we know every message ID that we're recording and that it's coming in through uh, a monotonically increasing, increasing identifier, we can use a hash mod algorithm to deterministically pick a peer for it to pair with. So let's say that top one it's, it's going to pair with, it's going to read that entry, and as a side effect, it's going to establish a watch on that peer. It needs to be in this direction, because if, if it was in the other direction and the original peer failed, no one would be able to pick it up and you could get your cluster into a bad state. So we first add a watch outwards. Next, that same peer is going to write a message in the notification phase, say message number like 51, other things could be happening concurrently, they can interleave just fine. It's going to broadcast out that message. All peers are reading these messages, but they're using their own identifier to pick out which one should be doing what thing. So this peer knows it's looking for the notification message, it receives it, and as a reaction, it's going to use its replica to figure out who that original peer was pointing to. So we've actually closed the ring again. We have an extraneous connection that we need to clean up, and so there's a third phase, which is uh, the acceptance phase. That same peer, oops, sorry, is going to broadcast out a message. The original peer that helped it stitch in reads it, and fire side effects by cleaning up and getting rid of its extraneous link. And after that, you have a fully closed cluster uh, and you, you converge back onto the original ring. So widening takes more messages uh, than a departing node leaving does. Uh, resource allocation is a really interesting part of this design because as you're reading left to right, left to right in the log, you can actually figure out who's doing what as a pure function based off of the replica value. You take all the peers, all the work to be done, and all the work that's already happening, feed it through a peer function, and then get out a topology of who should be working on what. And if there's a diff in what you're doing, all you do is pivot from the last thing you're doing to the thing that you should be doing. And I, we looked at so many different uh, third-party solutions for this, and like Mesos is a thing that you could use, there's lots of other heavier tooling, and all I wanted was the peer function, and like nobody had that. And we found a library called Better Place, uh, a Java-based solution that has a very rich constraint set, and it's just perfect, it works like a charm. It has uh, declarative properties to basically say, given a set of things to be done and people do it, and a set of constraints on that, I'll tell you who should be working on what. And this works great and gives us really sophisticated scheduling functions. 
All right, so I just want to finish out by talking about things that are not awesome with this architecture because I, we didn't solve every problem here. We introduced new problems because we have new guarantees and such is life. Um, so there are bottlenecks when we try specifically to scale to really big uh, cluster sizes. I don't think anyone in this room, if you're running it, is probably going to hit this. this. These are more like, you know, hundreds, a couple hundred thousand machine clusters that I know are going to break. We just haven't done them yet, and things will need to change when we get to it. Uh, yeah, like I said, like you hit like 500 machines, you're going to see these things, I think. Um, so first of all, the replica size is going to be a problem because the replica is an in-memory value that needs to fit on the machine in every peer. So if you have a huge cluster, you're going to have the structural information about the whole cluster. You're going to need to know where every peer is. And I mean, maybe you're using bigger machines if you're, you're using a large cluster. And the replica value isn't huge. But if your cluster is huge, I mean, I think this is going to start to be a problem. So we could, one thing we could do is take the replica and put it on disk and use a very lightweight database to pull values in and out of it. Uh, not a priority, but just something to think about. The replica is sitting in memory, and that's, uh, that's, that's pretty crucial. Uh, another thing that's tough is that the, the join process from scratch is three, phase, three phases, and that's kind of a lot. So if you try to converge 4,000 peers all at the same time, uh, it's going to take longer than it should. Uh, it's not awful, but it's just, it doesn't boot up quite as quickly as I'd want it to. Uh, so one thing we could do is uh, have like a join direct uh, function where you don't need to know where Zookeeper is off the bat. If you know the location of exactly one other peer, you can have a bi-directional exchange with that peer and then just do it locally really quickly and then only send a message when you're online. Then you're back to one face, and that's pretty good. And that does have the caveat that you need to know the existence of one other peer that's in your cluster already. Um, so this might not be appropriate for like medium-sized clusters because it's a little bit operationally more difficult, but it's something that needs to be there eventually. Um, log activity, we, we count on it not being heavy traffic, but even if you have you know, only a little something and then you scale up your cluster by a hundredfold, now that little something becomes a lot of something just by nature of the math. Um, and so this will be the most difficult problem to conquer, I think, because you're going to have more contention on Zookeeper, specifically on reads, and then sequentially ordered writes. I have an idea. I just want to throw it out there and, and see if anyone does some thinking on this. I don't really have time to work through this, and this is probably a design that's going to happen like you know, two years up the road for us. So I'm not trying to say that this is happening next, but it's in the back of my mind, and I'm just kind of kicking ideas around. Um, suppose that this ring is absolutely huge. It's just you know, tens of thousands of machines. One of the nice properties of peer-to-peer uh, -peer and masterless architectures is that they're actually more general than, than a master-based master, master architecture in that you can elect one-off leaders. Right? We do that all the time. For instance, picking which peer is going to need to help new peers join in. We've essentially elected a master. So what you can do is pick masters in subsections of the ring and have them establish little zones. So now you, you sort of have like a four-way sharded cluster where these zones are basically the same architecture that I described, but communication interzone is going to follow a more traditional approach. Uh, and, and one thing that can come in handy here uh, that I've implemented before and was helpful was the chord algorithm for peer-to-peer -peer communication. And they, you would use the chord algorithm when you have you know, massive numbers of processes that don't all know about each other but need to arbitrarily contact each other. The nice property of CORD is that you can have uh, log n based communication to find any machine in your cluster, which means if you have a million machines, it will take at most five messages to figure out where the machine is you're looking for, which is pretty darn good for coordination related messages given that they don't need to be ultra high performance. And so the idea would be that you have a peer inside of a zone, could contact its local master to figure out where a peer in a different zone is so that you can actually just skip to a known master and cut down on the communication overhead, thus reducing your replica size and reducing the amount of log traffic. Uh, the last thing I wanted to just kind of throw out there was we have centralized storage in Zookeeper to have every entry of the log. Could we switch to a gossip-based protocol where you take your entry and you put it on stable storage, but rather than everyone uh, eagerly pulling things down from storage, you know, could you gossip to your neighbors about the entry that you just put on the log so that you reduce contention? I don't know if this is possible with the design constraints that we have, but I think it's really interesting to think about when I have some free time. So if anyone has an idea, um, hammock time is always appreciated. Um, 
That's all I have. I have about five minutes for questions. I also have laptop stickers up here, so if you want one, come up when we're done. Uh, happy to take any questions now. Uh, they'd be different because the exact one stuff comes down to a, a different log that we keep in Bookkeeper. That does need to be high performance because that pertains to the messages that you're routing through your cluster. But this stuff is just the coordination things. So actually, they don't need to be exactly once because they're just pure and idempotent and you could apply them as many times as you want and it'll be fine. How do you deploy new code? Ah, that's an interesting question. Okay. So we take a very different stance to deployment than most other... Um, most other platforms that are similar to this. Because usually you have a master uh, and you give it a jar and it like SCPs the jars to your cluster. Onyx is really a library. You, you implement your stuff according to the data protocol and then you call a function in your main method which starts your peers for you. It'll start your threads up in your thread pool. You, you would block on your main so your main stays up forever. And then you essentially take your jar however you would like and then put it on the target nodes in your cluster. Uh, and I like to do that with like Docker and Kubernetes. Um, and, and you're off, they're off and running. The peers start and they know where Zookeeper is, so they just they continually enact that way. Any other questions? Can you characterize the kind of work problems that you solve here? Um, beyond batch and streaming? I mean, I'd have to think. We, we, work, we do a lot of consulting work. Uh, um, I mean, domain wise? I, I, the reason I'm hesitant is with new consulting work, it's kind of difficult to talk about what exactly you're working on, unfortunately, as other companies could tell you. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Thanks, everyone.